morning. Thank you. So well, I, I call this how to GIS in Python and uh, with a subtitle of A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, it was supposed to be about um, the city of my university, Aarhus and uh, Istanbul, but uh, due to time restraints, I have uh, chosen not only to talk about Istanbul, it's the more interesting case uh, anyways, but, but so the subject is a little bit uh, wrong, but it was kind of funny. Okay, let's go on. So about me, uh, my name is Anders Lehmann. This is a compact edition of my CV. Um, what I, well, it's not very important, but now I'm working uh, at uh, Aarhus University in the uh, engineering school of, uh, of Aarhus. And I'm teaching uh, electronic engineers, uh, physics and programming. So, uh, and part of my work is to uh, finish my PhD. So in one year's time, I have to uh, deliver my dissertation. And I, I'm doing the PhD in the, in the context of a funded uh, project called EcoSense, which is about collective uh, mobile sensing and modeling uh, of uh, emissions from mainly traffic. So, and the emissions is, is there's two kinds. You could say two kinds of emissions you are, we are interested in. And the one is the climate gases, the CO2 and the methane and stuff like that. And the other other kind of emissions we are interested in are the more pollutant or the more uh, more acutely uh, toxic pollution coming from uh, car traffic. There's also a visualization part of that uh, uh, project, which I'm not a part of, so. Okay, but the idea is that you, you ask people to use a special app on the mobile phones, and then we get uh, data about how they are moving around in the cities, in the country, and we can use that data, these data to, to make uh, models. So the contents of this talk is, like this, so a little short introduction to what GIS is. I'm not going to go into all the, all the there's a lot of detail in, in, in GIS and I'm, I'm going to just hand wave on that. Uh, look up, I'll look up on a couple of uh, applications for GIS. Uh, I think I'm, I'm more interested in applications, uh, so that's, that's my forte, you could say. Uh, a little bit about where you can find data to use on your GIS uh, systems or applications. Something about the Python tools available, uh, uh, some examples. And then I will go uh, end, if I have time, to talk about my research on, on uh, building a uh, transportation model for uh, Istanbul. Okay, so. Yeah, let's get on with it. So what is GIS? Well, it's, it's a, GIS is, stands for Geographical Information Systems and it's all about maps. There you go, that is, that's it. Simple? Well, not just a moment because we live on a sphere, uh, the Earth is spherical and we would like our maps to be flat two-dimensional so so how do you how do you fit a sphere on a on a, a piece of paper that's that's where all the nitty-gritty uh, things are coming from in uh, GIS how to project uh, the uh, spherical uh, uh, things on, on our earth into a two-dimensional map and it, it turns out that there was a lot of way, a lot of different ways to, to do these projections, and which each of, of these uh, ways have have uh, certain properties, which are uh, good, some good pr properties. But but uh, there, are, there are no projection which can have all the good properties that you can do. So some projections uh, 
uh, retain area or some retain length and stuff like that. So, so depending on your application, you will need different uh, kinds of projections. But um, luckily, uh, this has mainly been solved, uh, in my view. Uh, there's a there's a database containing 4,000 different uh, projections, and there is a standard way to to uh, convert from one uh, map type to another map type. So, so if you have legacy maps, you just need to uh, to know which kind of projection that map is use, using, and then you can turn the data into uh, the, the map uh, projection that you need. Um, the m most well, most um, modern maps are using this uh, WSG84 uh, projection. And uh, so if, if you start a new project, and then it might be a good idea to, to, to try to use uh, uh, this uh, projection, which is kind of standard. So, so the, the nitty-gritty part of GIS is mainly this projection part. Uh, there's a lot of mathematics and, and stuff involved in that, and it's kind of hard and confusing. So I'm, I'm just going to punt that to, to someone who knows about it and go on with uh, the applications. So there are quite a lot of different uh, applications uh, for GIS. Uh, this is just one application. This is from Denmark. All the black dots here are uh, are the street lamps in uh, in my area. So, someone the municipality municipality has has just has uh, to keep track of their inventory of street lamps. They have made a map where they have put in all the locations of the, the street lamps. So. That's a way of keeping track of uh, your assets, and it's a way that they can they can use for planning. Uh, they know how many street lamps they ha have, and they know where they are. And if they have to be serviced or something like that, you can you can plan in uh, how how many cars do you need to to service these lamps, and in which order would it be a nice thing to do? So that's one application: the the assets uh, tracking. Uh, uh, of things that you put out in your environment. Another way, uh, another asset tracking application is is uh, to keep track on where you put down your sewage lines, your underground cable, your uh, your electric cables, and stuff like that, so that you hopefully uh, can educate uh, contractors so that they not they're not ruining anything when they have to dig into the ground. So. Uh, fleet management, this is more a dynamic uh, tracking thing, but you still, you would like to know where all your uh, taxis or cars or trucks, where they are and where they are going. So you, you need to, to put them on the map, maybe dynamically, but still an, on a map. And if, you, uh, if you're a city planner, you would like to have uh, accurate maps so that you can, you can plan for uh, for different zones in, in, in the city, where should the industri industrial uh, facilities where be, and where should the residential area be, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and in, in these kinds of maps, you also need uh, features of uh, of the uh, of, of the geography. Is this hilly? Are there swamps? And uh, what kind of uh, what is the ground made of uh, on these specific sites? So that, that's another way of, of putting information uh, into maps that you can use for, uh, for GIS uh, things. Okay. And of course, uh, routing, uh, which is, I, I think is a very important and very used nowadays, you very used uh, application of GIS. Uh, we do it on our smartphones, we do it in specialized GPS uh, uh, route finders in our cars and stuff like that. So it's, it has been a very successful application of GIS. I, I, 
of course, we all we, we call it uh, GPS receivers because, but the GPS only gives us a position. We need the maps to actually find the way uh, from one point to another, and, and uh, preferably the fastest uh, one. I also already meant, uh, mentioned uh, city planning, uh, but there is a specialized version of city planning, which is uh, traffic planning, uh, traffic modeling. This is where I have done some research uh, in, in uh, and, and, and the problem is, of course, that we, we want to plan our city so that we, we uh, get as little congestion as possible. In order to uh, plan for, for congestion, we need to have a model for where is the traffic going and when is it uh, going there. So, all right. Uh, where can we f find data for our maps? Well, uh, there's a very important resource called OpenStreetMap. I don't know if you know it, but uh, I think that it, it's, it might be undervalued and underused uh, because Google Earth is, uh, is of course, very, uh, or Google Maps is very, is very good. But uh, the OpenStreetMap, uh, has this further, um, um, well, it, it's an open format and, and you can actually go in and, and change uh, stuff if you want. If, if you live in an area and you uh, they build a new road or the closer road, or you can actually go in uh, and change that in your map, uh, in the open street map, and it's very easy to do that. Um, so, uh, so for, for, for researchers, I think that's uh, a very important thing that, that the data is uh, available and it's open and free to use. Uh, of course, I can use Google Maps for s just for static maps, but I can't uh, use it for to getting the features of, of the map. So uh, I can see a map where there are roads, but I can't really get the coordinates of these roads. Uh, that's a lit lit little bit harder to do that. Actually. But uh, there are other uh, sources. Uh, at least in Denmark, we have, a, uh, have na national data centers for a lot of different uh, uh, maps. Uh, there's a center called Environment GIS, which have all kinds of, of strange uh, information about uh, where the rivers are and, and, and uh, where the um, where there are depots for uh, Toxic waste and stuff like that. So you can you can uh, you can go there if you want to to research that. Um, uh, the municipalities also have these um, their sources. Some and that can actually be sometimes be a problem because they they tend to be quite old. Some of these uh, databases and they there you can actually risk to have a non-standard uh, protection mode and you can it can be quite hard and uh, to to convert these uh, legacy databases to to a more modern uh, projection so that you can use uh, uh, OpenStreetMap for instance with the old data from from the legacy database so uh, I, I just wanted to mention uh, I, I found this database the other day that about where all the cell towers for, for mobile phones are in, in Denmark, there, there's a database, so you could, yeah, you could find all, uh, the nearest cell tower if you knew where you were. So that's also, there. I think there must be applications for that uh, also. Okay, so uh, this is not easy to see, but, but I, I'm, the Python the tools that I have used the most is, uh, is uh, this? Uh, it's called Q or Quantum GIS. Q GIS. Um, this is a, visual, a visualization uh, program with a um, embedded Python uh, interpreter. So you can you can make all your scripting in uh, in Python. I'm sorry about the the, the colors here. I, I thought that. But uh, maybe we could just make a little 
demo here. So now it's 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 the same image, but just build a green color instead of the uh, light blue. This is actually all the roads in Istanbul. So there are 300,000 roads in Istanbul, and uh, but, and this is the only thing that is covered here. So you can actually see the Bosporus Strait, where there are no roads, and there are some islands here with with some uh, roads on. So, and then there are some mountains with, where there are no roads. So. But it's uh, this visualization program is actually fast enough to to accommodate uh, this quite large number of uh, roads. So you can see that it redraws quite fast, uh, actually. So um, the the other tool I would mention is the Arc GIS. It's a very it's a commercial product, uh, which also has a, an embedded uh, Python interpreter. Um, this is it seems very popular in in research. Uh, yeah, I've read several uh, uh, papers where they are using Arc GIS, uh, but. Uh, I think that I found QGIS a bit more approachable from the Python side, so I, I chose to do, to use that. So, yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about tools. The, these are not Python tools per, per se, uh, but they are very good uh, Bindings to them, so you can you can you can access them through Python. So, but but they are not really Python. So, uh, the Postgres database with the extensions called PostGIS and PT Routing are quite good. Um, they uh, so the Postgres is of course a very good uh, SQL database, um, and uh, the PostGIS uh, extension gives a lot of uh, of relevant functions to, to manipulate uh, uh, GIS data. So uh, I'm not going into the details, but uh, because that's that's a whole new uh, talk, I think. And on, on top of post GIS, the, uh, this PT routing extension has been built, so that you can you can uh, if you have a um, uh, if you put your, your data into uh, into the database, you can start to find the shortest paths uh, uh, from one point to another uh, using the, the, this extension. Uh, in order to uh, to do all the GIS conversion from, there are a lot of different formats, uh, not only projections but also data formats. Uh, but there are these uh, libraries available, G D I L and uh, and especially uh, OGR to OGR, uh, which can read almost any uh, relevant format and, and convert it to, to most of the other relevant formats. So they are very, very um, generic tools, but they are not that uh, hard to use, actually. And, and there are uh, Python bindings for, for both of them. So. OK. so. Uh, I talked about OpenStreetMap, and I'm just going to show you, um, hopefully, this was, uh, so I should, uh, there you go. So when you open OpenStreetMap, you, you get maps, of course, and I've Zoomed into to Bilbao, and you can maybe you can re uh, recall or recognize these uh, the river and the our venue. What is quite hard to see on this uh, with these colors is that there's actually uh, some problems with this map because uh, there's a you can walk like uh, along here. Uh, and actually, you can go under the bridge, and you can continue on this footpath here. But there is no connection from this bridge to to this footpath. 
uh, and but that's not hard to change. You can just press edit, and if you have logged in and stuff like that, you are presented with this view, and you can then choose to to connect this footpath here. Oh, sorry. I have to press with this footpath. And then you just have to uh, do that once more. So now I have put in the, a new line here, and I should put in the metadata as well, that this is a, uh, this is, dot, 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 dot. that's a path. So when uh, I have put in, the, I don't know if the, it has a name or, or if I should prepare the surface and stuff like that, but there are, there are a lot of, of uh, metadata that you can put in uh, to OpenStreetMap. And w when you're satisfied, you can just press save and then it will be updated to the database. So, and I, I want you to, to recognize that it is very easy and it's actually could be beneficial for the uh, for for at least for me as a researcher if uh, if the open street map is as correct as possible so i want to to urge you to when you notice something changed in in your local environment please cons try uh, to to go into the open street map and uh, we can take it later, right? Yeah. And, and, and change it. It's very easy and it's very nice uh, when it's working, uh, when it's correct. So let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so now we come to my, to my stuff. The traffic model that I've been working with uh, and yeah, of course, this might be very boring for you because uh, th this is, of course, my pet. So maybe I go into too much detail about this. But, but the the reason why we want to have a tra traffic model is uh, in uh, we, we want to be able to predict how the traffic flows through a network. Um, we want to be able to predict where the congestions are and and uh, and we specif especially we want to predict how uh, if we change the network how would that uh, how would that uh, change the flow through the network um, so what i have been working with is a model that that considers how p uh, people actually choose where to drive so it's kind of uh, a selfish model for for drivers, uh, and the, in in the research is it's uh, usually called the assignment problem. It's how to assign drivers to uh, different routes in a, a network. Uh, the the uh, basic principles are, are derived from econometrics, uh, and it's based on on finding equilibriums uh, and steady state solutions. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of a static uh, model. So you, 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 you find out what is the demand for, for going from one place to another, and then you try to find the steady state solution for, uh, for that network. So it, it's not dynamic uh, per se, but it's uh, the, the, the big problem with, uh, with these kind of models is that there are actually a very large number of different possible routes. And if you want to make a computer, find the, the, the how people are distributed through all these routes is actually a, a, a large problem. So this is a, this is a picture of, uh, of Copenhagen, or the central part of Copenhagen anyway. So at the bottom right, we have the Copenhagen airport and uh, there's a motorway coming down from the north. 
So this is uh, an assignment to, to see how will the uh, how will traffic uh, flow through the Copenhagen area in in the morning when people come from the north and I want they want to go to the to the airport. So the large path here is uh, the motorway. There's a, a motorway all the way array around uh, Copenhagen and it goes to the airport. So I'll, of course, most people choose to, to go about it like that. But as as many uh, as more and more people come onto the motorway, the, it it turns out that the, the traffic flows, and then it actually show, uh, there is other ways that are uh, quite as fast, and they are going to uh, through the center of of the Copenhagen, which um, might not be that nice for for the for the morning, morning traffic in the central uh, Copenhagen. So, but the idea here is that we try to find out how many are going at each route. And uh, when we have an equilibrium, everyone would have the same travel time. That's the basic idea because um, then we have uh, what we call a, a user equilibrium. Okay, so the, how, how do we model congestion? Well, we, we know that, that uh, roads have a capacity. They are designed to, to have a certain amount of cars per hour. Uh, this is the CA in the bottom here. And when we reach the capacity, we know that the traffic slows. And we model that with this uh, uh, simple uh, power formula. So the time it takes to go through a, a link is given by the free flow time. That's the, the flow we would normally, you would experience if there were no other cars uh, on the road. And then we uh, have this power function where, when when the volume uh, of the cars are, are approaching the capacity, then we uh, it takes longer and longer time. So this is a very old uh, formula, but it has has worked for. It, it still works, and uh, it's 50 years old or something like that. But it gives actually a very good uh, approximation on how traffic uh, flows. And we can use this uh, idea if we now we have a, 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 a two route between uh, our origin and destination, and uh, we want to assign traffic to these two routes in such a way that the travel time is the same on these two routes, and we can find the, the equilibrium point where these two uh, uh, congestion curves cross. That's the basic idea. The, the user equilibrium is, a, is the assignment where everyone has the same travel time. Because if we all have the same tra travel time, we can't, uh, we can't have a better travel time by choosing another route. That's the basic idea. It's, I think it's uh, attributable to Nash equilibriums, if, if you heard about them. So it ties into all this game theory and economics and selfish uh, users and stuff like that. Uh, user equilibrium, the deterministic part here is only applicable uh, in, in uh, very small networks because you need to consider all, uh, all possible routes. And so we, and as in even small networks, there's a lot of different possible routes, so it's, uh, it's not really f feasible to do uh, deterministic the, the user models. So people have invented uh, stochastic methods where you can look at, uh, well, the, the basic formulation is that instead of being certain that you have the best possible uh, route, the, 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 the shortest time, uh, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can put in some uh, stochasticity, and then we can, then people think they have the best uh, route. So, but there's a, there's a bit of uncertainty, and this uncertainty we can model, and we can, uh, we can use that to, to drive the assignment uh, process. Um, so it turns into, since we are looking for the, the smallest travel time, it's an uh, extreme value uh, problem in stochastic, uh, and we can, there are uh, different formulations for it, but uh, the one I have worked with is this pass uh, 
uh, size lotted, where you uh, where you look at how uh, how the path are, are, are looking uh, if they are looking uh, like if uh, different routes use the same links. Uh, so. So the, the stochastic user equilibrium part is uh, nice because uh, you can use stochastic methods, and, uh, but there are still, uh, the problem with the stochastic user equilibrium is that there will be a non-zero probability to use every route. So it might be a very small probability that you use a very stupid route, but it's will, it will be there and it will be calculated, so you, you, you kind of uh, underestimate the, the good parts, uh, the good routes. So that's uh, not so nice. So in the Istanbul case, I have uh, I've used data from, from, uh, from OpenStreetMap, so you can just, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a way that you can actually, you, can, you don't need to have the complete, uh, complete data set, you can just pick what area that you want the data from, and then uh, it's, uh, I have, uh, it's converted into a topology so that you have uh, a network where everything is connected, uh, the, and, and it's turned into segments instead of uh, roads. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of detail. But, but there are 300,000 uh, road segments. I have done a simulation with uh, 2,000 origin destination pair. Uh, I used the Postgres uh, thing and uh, have implemented a combination of, uh, of the deterministic user equilibrium and the uh, stochastic user equilibrium so that, we, uh, so that I can assign uh, uh, traffic to different routes. Uh, and I used QGIS for the uh, visualization, so, uh, and it, I think it's kind of nice. You, uh, you can see uh, on the left-hand side here, the, you can see the elephant. That means that there's a di direct connection from the QGIS to the Postgres da database, and I can just point uh, QGIS to my database and then, uh, ask it to show all the routes uh, in my uh, solution set. And th this is from, uh, this is how I have, uh, how my algorithm has assigned the traffic to, to the different routes. So, of course it's, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of detail that I can't really, uh, I haven't time to, to cover here. So that was my demo, okay. So uh, in conclusion, so the way that I have used Python is to drive all the other tools. Uh, there are, there are uh, libraries for doing routing directly in Python, uh, but uh, it was actually very easy and fast to use Postgres, so I just, uh, I just did that. So there are many tools and now I'm prompted to end my talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, it's confusing, but it's doable. I think that's my main conclu conclusion. So, thank you. Okay, do you have, do you have any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, you uh, you uh, do a lot of theoretical research uh, and traffic congestion, but uh, do you actually get uh, signals uh, from drivers? And uh, do, do you? And my question is mainly because companies get that from their devices, like Nokia or Google. They, they get that from uh, from users. But you, as an independent researcher, where where do you get the signals from? Well, I'm, I'm part of this EcoSense. Uh, Project and so uh, there was, uh, in this project there were three PhD students. One should do the the uh, 
mobile applications, and one did the modeling, that's me, and one did the visualization. So, so we have uh, we have made this library for uh, so it's easy to make applications that send us data, and we have made some applications for uh, to get users to use it. So there's an application called Are You E-Ready, where you can uh, download this application. Uh, use it for a month, and then there will be an, an, an analysis if your traffic pattern is fit for a e-car. And if it is, you can borrow an e-car for a month back uh, after that. So, uh, so that uh, have given us some uh, data. There's another project called uh, uh, Herning Drives to the Moon, or Bicycles to the Moon, where we uh, but the municipality of Herning, it's a small town where I teach, uh, they want people to bicycle to, to work. And then they, have, they ask people to use this application which will measure the, the length of the bike distance and then accumulate it to hopefully uh, get it to, to, so that they could bike to the moon and back. That also gives us the data also when they are driving in their cars. So, so there, have, there have been uh, a, a several small scale uh, applications like that that gives us uh, some data uh, which, we, which I can use uh, to, to extract routes and see where people are actually moving. And I, and I get the speed information as well so I can also guess where there is congestion. So, so I, can, I can use this data to also uh, uh, see if my, my uh, models are correct. Okay, more questions? There was one here during the talk. Uh, I have one question in my comment. Uh, a question. Uh, Okay, I use Postgres for large uh, lists of uh, of uh, points, geographical points, and areas and lines. Uh, is there something uh, directly in Python that I, what would you recommend if I have uh, a few thousands of points and I want to find uh, the closest ones or to group them? Uh, yeah. What library would you recommend to store longitude, latitude, and so on? Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll look briefly at. Uh, PyRoute, which is a, has a routing facility, I guess. Um, I'm not, I don't remember the, the, the data format that they use for storage. Um, but there are, you could look for Dijkstra. There would be several implementations of, uh, of, of Dijkstra, the Dijkstra path finding, uh, road finding uh, algorithm. Uh, so you could use that, of course. Okay, thank you. And a comment to OpenStreetMap? Yes. It's actually not a map, it's a database of geographical yes. data, yes, yes. freely available. Uh, you have uh, just now, d you did an update uh, to this uh, path uh, here in Bilbao. Uh, in between uh, the increasing number of uh, contributors to OpenStreetMap and the increased complexity of all the routes you can do, you can make a lot of uh, further um, attributes uh, is uh, somehow sometimes uh, it's uh, too much for new users and not inviting them because they oh i have a lot of things to learn and in openstreetmap uh, there is a nice feature where you even don't have to uh, to sign up uh, mark a problem or a, a bug submit the bug it is directly on the page and you can just uh, put a marker anywhere on the map and write uh, in your language yeah there is some change that it is yeah. this is false and you have to and there is always someone just like you or me or anyone else who goes to the area and then looks at this and uh, fixes the the problem on yeah. the on the best way possible yeah I had to do it for the Istanbul case because I noticed that the the routes that my algorithm found was, well, it was not how the taxi drivers and the bus drivers drove, so I had to find out why, and then it turned out that there was a missing roundabout, so, so I just put that in, and so, yeah. Uh, th there's also another feature which I think is a good feature for OpenStreetMap. There's a, there's, they are trying to automatically find problems, so, for instance, if a footpath uh, crosses a, a motorway, 
that should not happen. So they mark it uh, with an error. So there's a lot of automatic features to, to find uh, problems. Uh, so if you are bored, you can also look at all these uh, in your own area. You can look for the errors uh, in, in, uh, in OpenStreet. There's a special map where you, all the errors is uh, pointed out. So you could just uh, correct them if you are native to that area. Okay. Okay. Um, that would be a good time to move to the next talk. And let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Next talk will be in four minutes.